Hallo, guten Abend, herzlich willkommen zu der letzten Sitzung in unserem Cornelia Goethe Kolloquium uh, Never Too Old to Be Seen, uh, Aging and Gender in European Cinema. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir heute Abend wieder so uh, ein großes Publikum haben. Uh, so now I'm switching to English. Our speaker, or actually our speaker and I will be her co-speaker or respondent or partner in dialogue tonight is uh, Dr. Asia Mokarevich, who in the HC program uh, actually represents the Frankfurt Lab. So this is a home gang for her. Uh, this is where uh, she is a researcher. Um, but her research in HC actually covers multiple territories, uh, Germany, Switzerland, and that's the example that we'll discuss here tonight. And of course, um, her country and region of origin, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, and the other countries, also known as former Yugoslavia. Um, uh, Alja Makarevic uh, received her PhD from this university two years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. For um, a, a, I think, but I'm a supervisor, but you can still trust me, absolutely stunning piece of research on um, images of non representation in post war Yugoslav cinema. It's basically a map of different representation strategies that have emerged and evolved in post Yugoslav cinema across the countries that formed that came out of what formerly was Yugoslavia. And one of the key insights of the book is that um, the post Yugoslav realm remains stuck in the post war condition, which is terrible because uh, there's no end to it. And part of the reason why there's no end to it is that there is no shared narrative about what happened and, and what it all means. And a good part of Ojo's analysis, and I think that's the central insight of her analysis, is to show how incompatible the dominant narratives are and to focus on films that problematize this situation but also provide point the way towards an issue a way out of the permanent terrible permanent post-war condition so there's a uh, an acuity and perception and analysis in this book but also a sense of for the tragic uh, which, if you ever find the time to read it, when it comes out soon from Amsterdam University Press in open access, uh, you will find this a rare distinction in academic writing. Um, Aja has joined HC um, now almost a year ago, and uh, covers again the territories, the German and foreign territories, plus uh, former Yugoslavia in, in her studies. Um, one of the claims that we make in the project is that there's an added value in a pan-European comparative perspective. Uh, that we can add something to our understanding of aging, the representation, and the fact of the representation of aging and gender in European cinema if we look at different case studies and if we combine case studies from Western Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, Northwestern Europe um, and uh, look actually for differences and similarities, tease out certain topoi that, that uh, are recurrent. Um, the successful aging narrative, for instance, is one that you keep finding in certain places but not in other places as we will find tonight. Um, and, and so, what Asia and I would like to propose today is in a way. Uh, an attempt to put that assumption to the test. How much can we really learn by uh, comparing uh, films from different cultural settings uh, across Europe and um, how much additional insight can we gain by uh, asking ourselves if there are culturally specific strategies and modes of the representation of aging and gender in European cinema um, and how much we can learn about this uh, in the mode of comparison. The way we're going to go about this is that we're trying to create an initial sense of estrangement and alienation, so to speak, by uh, looking at 
films from the other's territory, country, circle of origin. Which means that, in my case, that um, Asia is going to look at primarily and talk about the Swiss film. Um, and uh, I am going to talk a bit about uh, a Serbian film, which hopefully many of you have seen just now. It was screened at 4 o'clock. And the Swiss film that Asia um, is going to talk about is uh, the film with which we opened um, the screening series of this uh, colloquium, Late Bloomers by Bettina Oberli um, from 2006. Late Bloomers was a massive, massive commercial success. Uh, it premiered at the Locarno Film Festival, which has a beautiful open air screening venue on the Piazza in Locarno, which typically seats about 10,000 people per screening. And uh, it's one of those venues, if you were successful there and your film goes to the cinemas, then it will also uh, quite plausible. And so, um, Lake Bloomers, it was one of the most successful Swiss films of the last <coughs> 20 years. I think it sold uh, about 400,000 tickets, which is a lot in Switzerland. Um, the most successful film of all time in Switzerland is, is a film about an immigration officer who falls in love with Tellingly, a woman from Serbia. Um, and that film sold one million tickets. That record has never been matched. The second most successful film in Switzerland remains Titanic at 900,000. So it's a 50% Titanic success, which means it's a Titanic success. Um, <coughs> The, the other film is um, Have You Seen This Woman, which is a recent film from Serbia, um, which uh, made quite a splash at the Venice Film Festival when it came out, but was not as commercially successful, I, I don't think, in its own territory. And it wasn't widely distributed um, in cinemas in Western Europe, but it's extremely pertinent and relevant um, to, uh, to our topic. Um, in terms of the setup, I may, may add a note of caution. Um, picking Switzerland and former Yugoslavia as territories where encounters that we have as people who originate from one of these territories with films that originate from the other territory, uh, there could be a legitimate question about whether or not Switzerland is such a bright choice because um, one of the if not the artistically most impressive film director right, working right now in Switzerland has parents from Sarajevo and Dubrovnik. Uh, her name is Andrea Stauka. She's, I think, currently, no offense to Bettina, I believe, um, the best director working in the country right now. And interestingly, in Switzerland, she's always treated as the Yugoslav director, which is absurd because she's never been there for a minute. Her films talk about migration, but um, first was fun. But in any case, so there's an intertwinement between the two territories that's also pretty interesting. Um, that will probably come into play. The way we're going to go about this is that we're going to first have a presentation by Algia, where she lays out the terms of reference, the analytical concepts that we want to employ in our discussion. Um, I will then uh, offer a brief response talking about. Um, uh, have you seen this woman um, by uh, Matija Luzevic and Dujan Zoric? Um, and I will try to highlight some of the things that um, I found uh, remarkable in this film. And then we're going to explore um, interlacing uh, experiences of cultural estrangement and ask about the cultural specificity of representations of aging and gender. And at a certain point, we'll, we'll open this to a uh, discussion with you, and that's the program for the evening. And with that, I hand over to Marcia and her opening presentation. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here, uh, for joining us uh, in this experiment. Uh, we are also curious to see what it's going to look like. <laughs> and it will be uh, lots of surprises, because uh, two films are challenging in a dialogue with one another. I'm happy to be here at the, the closing, as I was uh, happy to be at the opening um, uh, event of the Kernel and Goethe uh, uh, series. 
and uh, I hope we will find uh, also possibilities to collaborate in the future. Uh, it was really nice so far, and I will now start with my presentation. Um, so, as you can see, the title is Have You Seen These Women? Uh, Cultural Specificity and the Invisibility of Old Age Across Film Cultures. Uh, it is often said that women become invisible in society after a certain age. However, aging women have certainly become more visible in European cinema over the last two decades. But how do filmmakers from different parts of Europe negotiate the visibility of aging women on screen? Does cultural specificity matter in the invisibility of old age across film cultures? So these are the questions, the big questions that we ask. And to answer them, as Vince said, we developed this experimental setup, which we present and discuss in a joint lecture. We look for cultural specificities in performance and reading of age and gender in Swiss and post Yugoslav cinema by analyzing these two examples. Uh, we assume that there are codifications of age and gender which are imminent to the socio-political context from which these films originate and in which they find their primary audience. To make these codifications salient and legible, we put them to the test in the cross-cultural analysis and the ensuing discussion. So you're really welcome to engage at any point, also to interrupt us if you have uh, good ideas and questions because we would like to explore these films together with you, that's the aim. And actually to hear you more, perhaps, uh, with your own ideas. So we are uh, particularly interested in performative transgressions uh, of socially imposed norms. So my presentation makes uh, use, uh, this is a poster of the film, the uh, head by closing, excuse my German accent, uh, uh, from Bettina Oberle from 2006. Vincent said already enough uh, about this film, and I will uh, analyze it in more detail, but before that I will lay out the, the theoretical framework. So my presentation makes use of performativity by cultural uh, gerontologist Catherine Woodward, and uh, uh, first of all, uh, performativity of uh, gender and old age uh, as conceptualized by philosopher Judith Butler and expanded by cultural gerontologists uh, Catherine Woodward and Margaret Gillette, respectively. A closer attention will be paid to Gillette's understanding of progress narrative as negotiated within the conventions of Heimat genre and extrapolated in Bettina Oberle's film. Spinozian concept of the active and affirmative body as further theorized by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari under the term becoming woman and revisited in contemporary Film feminist theory will be taken into account as a way to negotiate the discrepancy between the decline and progress narratives. Okay, much has been said, it will be, become clear very soon, I hope. So, as Catherine Woodward famously stated in her book, Figuring Age, older women are both invisible in that they are not seen and hyper visible in that they are all that is seen. Uh, her notion of invisibility of older women is closely connected with her understanding of a cultural perception of the chronological and biological age. Chronological age refers to the number of years a person has lived. It is a passage of a chronological time, time that is quantifiable, measurable time, the notion of time beloved by bureaucrats, so to say. And biological and functional age concern the state of a person's physical capacities, capabilities. Uh, in her essay, Performing Gender, Performing Age, Woodward suggests that for women, the cultural dichotomy of youth and old age has long been underwritten by the bi biological dividing line between the reproductive and post-reproductive years, with the symbolic date of older age for women understood as coinciding with menopause, around the age of 50. So this is very uh, important distinction. Uh, distinction when the woman reaches age 50, which is like a symbolic and approximate, uh, the, 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 the time when the woman uh, enters a menopause, as the time that is being on, or underwritten socially, so sociologically, so to say, as, as the time that divides, as, as, as the point of time that divides her time between young and old age, as opposed to only retirement age. So I will come back to this point a bit later. And Vincent will have to say something about it, I, I guess, in his analysis of the film. 
So uh, essentially, women are deemed old once they can no longer reproduce. What is at play here are cultural assumptions, expectations which are mapped onto biological functional changes and the chronological passage of time. And this is what Margaret Goulet defines as being aged by culture. As you can see here, the use of aging in its passive form, aged by, can be understood as a fixed state imposed on a subject as opposed to an ongoing process in which a subject willingly participates. A state of uh, oppression as contrasted with an ongoing process of participation, if you will. I will return to this difference later in my film analysis. According to Goulet, such mapping of cultural expectations onto biological and functional processes produces a narrative of decline. So it's important to uh, yeah, remember this narrative of decline because we will kind of be coming back to this notion. And to this date, the decline that ideology of aging associated with the physical and functional deterioration of over time has been a dominant view in the field, despite attempts to move, move away from it, focusing on con concepts such as wisdom by Rika Edmundson, uh, resilience by uh, Louis Lipsitz, and uh -huh. academic successful aging, as you heard of already, by John Rowe and Robert Lewis Kahn, and uh, finally, progress narrative by Margaret Goulet. Successful aging has been discussed, as I mentioned, uh, and uh, it refers to high physical, psychological, and social functioning in old age without major diseases. Uh, Miranda Leontovic mentioned in the opening talk of the series, if some of you remember, that it, this is the most successful gerontolo gerontological theory, which critical social sciences have been battling for the past 40 years, but it still prevails. Prevails as a, as a theory which is opposing this decline uh, ideology. But it, it implies and it has a, a heterosexual uh, sectioned way of aging. Uh, under the term progress narrative, Gillette understands aging as a form of survival, recovery, resilience, and development, all the way up to collect resistance to decline forces. And now that I have provided a brief overview of the alternative narratives to the dominant decline narrative of aging, I would like to touch upon uh, Judith Butler's understanding of performance of gender and how her notion has been utilized to conceptualize performance of age. So for Butler, language is not a reflection of pre-existing reality, but an enactment of that which it names. Gender is being constructed, embodied, and naturalized through performative acts of masculinity, femininity, queer, and trans. As she emphasizes, one is not a body, but one does one's body and does it differently from one's predecessors, contemporaries, and successors. As Bettina Klein wrote up in the opening talk, for Butler, the governing structure is an intersection of gender and heterosexuality. Along the same lines, ageism could be understood as the structure that governs the performance of age. If gender is perceived as the adoption of certain practices, which over time we take to be our own, Age may as well be understood as the internalization of norms that by time become ours. However, Catherine Woodward reminds that age could not be a mere assemblage of such conventions because at a certain point it performs us. The body carried through time is the default body, notes Goulet. So basically there is a distinction between the performance of gender and age because at one point uh, the body, the materiality of body, gives the thing, signals that it's aging, it's changing biologically over the time, and there is a decline imminent to it. Uh, and this is the still from the film, which is kind of uh, actually very of the whole film, it must the same thing. <laughs> um, so I'll get back to it. But having the similarities and the distinction between the performance of gender and age in mind, and knowing the problem of successful aging, imposing an adequate alternative to the decline narrative, what other options could one account for? Could the progress narrative, which presupposes survival, recovery, resilience, and development, offer an adequate response to the ruling decline view? Could contemporary cinema provide a narrative with an affirmative account of aging, which does not engage in its denial? I will have a look at Lady Bloomers, which I understand to be an enactment of the progress narrative, 
but within the conventions of the Heimann genre to see possibilities but also challenges of accounting for the old female aging as entailed within the given form. So late bloomers uh, produced in 2006 centers on four old ladies who live in the Emmental region in Switzerland. And uh, just to briefly summarize, so Martha's husband dies and her three friends determined to help her come out of her sadness, encourage her to open a lingerie boutique at the age of 80. And given that they live in a conservative village, they face numerous obstacles. So Martha's son, Walter, he is a village biker, and her friend, Hani's son, uh, Fritz, is the politician. And both are esteemed members of community, and they appear more conservative and tradition-bound than their mothers, over whose lives they wish to exert control. So I suggest that we have a look at the trailer now. Uh, yeah, so the scene comes uh, in the film after Walter, uh, the, the son of Martha, heard in, in the pub that uh, his mother secretly produced uh, lingerie and that she decided to open the store in what used to be their family store. And, and he wants to rent this, he first wanted to rent this space and then decided actually it's better fit for the rehearsals of his Bible group. And uh, as could be seen in the scene, Marta is uh, joined by her friends, Lizzie and Vida. Uh, Lizzie, Lizzie with a short hair. Uh, she is a major force in the film, and she encourages Mar uh, Marta to uh, carry on with her tasks, despite all the amounting difficulties she has. And her recurring line in the film is how brave she was to leave the village in her youth and to travel to America to live her dream. Uh, her daughter, Shirley, uh, is the one who later comes in the shop, uh, and she is basically Walter's mistress, and Frida, um, the other one sitting with her, uh, is single, lives in elderly home. At first, uh, she's had, uh, skeptical about Marta's entrepreneurship ideas and the activities which are offered at the home where she's based, because she doesn't have really so ladies who she doesn't want to be up engaged, but over time she changes her mind and becomes supportive of her friend and masters a computer course in her 80s. And Hani, one of the, the women which was outside the store with a group of the others, is Martha's friend as well, and she's kind of dedicated to her family. Her husband, Ernst, is in a wheelchair and um, she takes care of him and is actually also dedicated to her son Fritz and his family. She supports them. And at first she was also in disapproval of Martha's choices, but by time she offered her uh, needed support. And she also gets a driving license so that she can bring her husband to uh, physiotherapy and is not dependent uh, on, on, on her son, uh, who is kind of um, uh, seeing everything as a cost, basically. Okay, how much time it takes me to bring my father to physiotherapy, it's, it's better to uh, place him in a nursing home and uh, rent uh, his place as a cabin, and so I wouldn't have this burden, yeah. And as a, one could see by watching the film, fourth age is perceived as a physical burden in this setting, and fourth agers are rendered as a societal waste, in a way. So they're deemed irrelevant, incapable of reaching decisions on their own, and as women, and they are regarded only through their motherly and grandmotherly roles, as wives and by extensions as the carers of their families across generations. They pose a threat uh, uh, to community by having their passions revealed at such late stages of their lives. Martha dreams of producing lingerie, which is an attribute of young age and femininity, and irreconcilable with the old age as performed and regarded by the little conservative community in Switzerland. Um, Despite all these obstacles, Marta at the end eventually becomes an entrepreneur. She has her boutique, even manages uh, to sell her underwear online, therefore adopts to the zeitgeist. She's busier than ever, makes profit, generates capital, and she's deemed worthy of society. So it's understandable why the film is the enactment of the progress narrative that I argued for, and I will look how this narrative is being negotiated within the conventions of Heimat's genre, 
And Alexandra Langen argues in her book, uh, Screaming Nostalgia, 100 Years uh, of German Heimat Film, the Heimat genre, uh, and I quote, uh, has epitomized the nexus between nation and narration. Uh, and well, this could be tracked throughout the history of genre, through the Nazi Heimat films, but also in most 1950s and 1990s unification films. It held the promises of rebirth, reinvention, integration of an individual within their community. And Langen argues that despite its semantic opaqueness, um, Heimat expressed uh, an quote, longing for a wholeness and unity, which for many seems lost, especially following the experiences of alienation, exile, uh, diaspora, or migration, physical as well as mental, as in the case of growing up, aging, maturing, etc. So it's in these uh, circumstances in which adjustments need to be made and long-standing familiarities become part of the past. Uh, the nostalgia for Heimat seems to manifest itself most clearly. Thus Heimat has become a melancholy term that speaks to us of nostalgia and of the past more than of the future. So what we have here is this longing for the wholeness, for the community, for the integration in the community, uh, amidst uh, all the, the challenges that one faces uh, in the, within the fast tempo of living, and also uh, caused by alienation, exile, diaspora. And, but it's also very uh, closely connected to this notion of nostalgia and return to the past. But the past that has never been lived, actually. The past that, that did, ne did never exist. Uh, and this nostalgic or melancholic gaze appears imminent to the high genre. It can be informed by the experience of aging, and as long as it suggests, quoting Horst Binek, and I quote, we are all exiles in the sense that we were driven from childhood into the adult world, and quote, yearning for the past which has never been inhabited, find its suitable expression in the high genre. Martha's longing transports her and the spectator alike, into her imagined past, even when she and her friends are portrayed at the advanced stage of their lives. The filmic expression of this melancholic gaze materializes in a fable-like universe. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, what's, what's interesting for me here is that um, in this kind of universe, it's possible for Marta to become an entrepreneur, for her friend Hani to get a driving license, and for, for Frida to master computer skills in their 80s. So something does not work right, I mean, one thinks of it. The images of beautiful landscape, sun-baked nature, soundscapes which connect folk music, church bells with the cheers, uh, with the cheers of happy congregations materialize in the film. And there is this tight linear plot, uh, which is, I believe, concomitant with the logic of progressive narrative. And it culminates in a village festival where all the members of community come together. And the film ends with the final duel between Marta and the main villain, Fritz, who is a politician, so the representative of society. And this duel takes place on stage ahead of the performance of the local choir in front of the uh, gathered villagers. So happy ending ensues, and the rebellious individual is reintegrated in community. Uh, stock characters like Viker, the representative of church, politician, the representat representative of society at large, they are the cornerstones of this otherwise uncomplicated realm of Heimat, I would argue. And it's trademark our traditional clothing, as you could see, and a recognizable set of props, which all have a soothing, reassuring effect on the viewers, at least in German-speaking countries, I'd say. Heimat, with its uh, numerous markers, like the clothing and props, takes place in a concrete or imaginary place. Uh, space. Uh, values and utopian fantasies are materialized in place, Alexander Langen and Johannes von Moltke would argue. And the aesthetic of fairy tale is pierced or intercut with instances of realism, which is why I argue that the film comes across more as an enactment of progress narrative than successful aging. These instances are the scenes and shots which remind us of the old age and its accompanying frailty. The moments of hesitation, insecurity, forgetfulness, and anguish associated with old age. 
something that Helen Black defines as little suffering as opposed to big suffering, or littleness as opposed to the bigness of suffering. And this is, and I quote for her, uh, daily frustrations, humiliations, no second chances to write a mistake and loneliness, end quote. What I find uh, poignant in the film are uh, particularly uh, the shots of Marta, above and Frida, when they are alone or kind of made as isolated in their respective surroundings. When the camera focuses on their little acts and gestures, the first third into the film, Marta is shown closely, touching the textile and laces on two occasions when she pays a visit to the store, so textile store in them, and near the end of the film, Frida is shown in a short, very, very short intercut scene, wearing a bra and observing her reflection in the mirror. What I would have wished for myself as a viewer in this film is that these, these shots and scenes uh, lasted a bit longer than they did, because they were really intercut carefully, but didn't last that long. So we can um, discuss why this is so later. Uh, and these instances, they bring to mind old age, but also sensuality. But not as a contradiction, but as a coexistent, co coexistence of different possibilities. Something that Catherine Woodward defines feminist aging. Old hands touching the textile and old body wearing a bra. Desire to become woman in a Deleuzean sense is conveyed strongest in these instances. Because we are exposed to the reality of old age, marked by the undeniable frailty of body, so in its own materiality, I would uh, say, uh, but also by the sense of hope, dignity, desire, to resist its inevitable decline forces and become something else. And here is where we come to Spinoza and his understanding of active and affirmative body, which offers a good, I believe, a conceptual framework to engage with the question of aging in a, an affirmative way, but which does not engage in denial of aging at the same time. So, uh, which is kind of situated between successful ages, uh, aging and uh, progress narrative as kind of a third possibility, let's put it that way. Uh, so Spinoza defines body not in terms of what it is, but in terms of what it can do and become. Uh, this implies that its meanings and capacities vary according to the context in which body finds itself. A Spinozian concept of the active and affirmative body is further theorized by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. Under the term becoming woman has been gaining more prominence in contemporary feminist theory. As Patricia Pister notes in her text, conceptual persona and aesthetic figures of becoming woman, every, and I quote, becoming is a process, an attempt to think differently, to see or feel something new in experience by entering into a zone of proximity with somebody or something else, end quote. A subject in the paradoxic situation of becoming is a subject who questions their identity, notes Pisters. Becoming woman is an inquiry into transforming and liberating the body and desire in multiple ways. And this uh, process is made a bit less obvious in Lady Bloomers and a bit more pronounced in Have You Seen This Woman? This is my take, but perhaps, uh, I don't know if Vincent agrees with this uh, note, but I will hand the microphone now to him and I look forward to what he's going to say about uh, the other film, which is a bit more challenging for the viewer, and yeah, I look forward to hearing that. Thank you, Ozio, for, for uh, laying out the, the framework and offering this uh, wonderful analysis of the film. Um, Herr Seidlosen, by the way, is a flower. Um, and uh, the literal translation, of course, is uh, the autumn flower that never ages. Oh. Uh, and, and so there's you know, multiple layers of, of meaning here, of course. Um, brilliant, brilliant poster for uh, Have You Seen This Woman? with the multiple classic faces. I think that really gets to the heart of what you were um, discussing and theorizing on the, on the rubric of um, uh, becoming woman. Or in this particular case, actually refusing to become a certain woman or refusing to be 
uh, assigned a certain role. <clears throat> I mean, what's significant about um, have you seen this moment is that the biological uh, age of the protagonist is given at 50 years of, uh, of age. So she's, that's like the cutoff uh, age of reproductive ability, um, the, the, the age of menopause. The actress, I think, is slightly older than, than 50. Now 57. 57, so she's, she's pushing 60, but, but her biological age is very specifically given as 50 years of, of age. And that, of course, uh, uh, I have read at least as an indication that uh, what they're talking about is the cutoff line of, of menopause and, and uh, reproductive ability. Um, I want to uh, start off with a note on statistics and geography. Um, <clears throat> part of that, the, this project, HC, is a project in a funding line entitled Challenges for Europe, the Grain Continent. So what the Volkswagen Foundation was saying is we have a problem that we need to talk about through the research that we're going to be funding, and that problem is that Europe is aging. Um, and uh, one of the most popular statistics and statistic visualizations that uh, um, you can find in policy circles is the so-called age pyramid. Uh, do you, do you know what the H pyramid is? Have you, have you ever seen an H pyramid? It's a visualization of the distribution of um, the population of a given country or region according to H cohort. Um, how many people between 0 and 10? How many people between 10 and 20? How many people between 20 and 30 are there in a given region or a given country? Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about the H pyramid is that um, there's only one region in the world at this point where that um, visualization looks like a pyramid. Um, take a while to guess what it is, it's Africa. Um, only in Africa do we have a age distribution where the lower rungs are the most populous. Um, and in, as a matter of fact, in a place like Nigeria, for instance, um, uh, more than half of the population is under 20 years old at this point. Um, at the same time, Africa doesn't have an aging problem in a certain sense because many of the societies on the African continent and, uh, are, you, well, to put it all, they're in the uh, patriarchal gerontocracies. Nobody questions the authority of old people. Nobody would ever think that old people, by virtue of simply existing, could pose a problem. But in a way, the framing of the challenge for Europe that um, uh, uh, the Volkswagen film labeled as the Grain Continent is that the aging population of Europe poses a problem by virtue of simply existing, by virtue of simply being around. Um, if you look at the so called H pyramid for Germany, for instance, it looks like a top heavy Christmas tree. So there's a, a, a long, thin stem, and then the big bulges come at the top, above 50, and again, above 70. Um, so that's not an age pyramid. It's an, uh, uh, an age uh, Christmas tree threatened to be uh, toppling over very, very soon. And um, if you uh, have followed political debates in Germany over the last 30 years, you know that one of the key concerns um, has always been uh, about the, the warranty for security benefits. So, uh, famous slogan by uh, one of the, when, when Zedu was still had a, left, had a left wing, one of the left wing Zedu politicians, um, Geisler, was, die Rente ist sicher. Trying to tell people. Norbert, sorry. Sorry? Norbert, Norbert. sorry. Norbert, it was not Geisler, it was Norbert, exactly. The guy with the little glass. But left wing Zedu. Um, uh, so th that was a slogan. He said, don't worry, uh, your retirement benefits are safe. And that was the key concern of, of politicians at the time. And um, at this point, we don't have to reopen the discussion. But there's a connection between that issue and migration, of course, because statistics will tell you that without immigration, Germany will not be able to guarantee the retirement benefits of the current generations. And, um, but that's a different, uh, a different arena. Um, 
what I'm trying to say is, or what I'm trying to reiterate, is a point that we also made at the beginning of, of this uh, seminar, or this colloquium, and which remains an important framing and a, sort of an important background argument for concepts such as successful aging, uh, which is the discussion of age in statistical terms as a potential um, public policy and public finance issue. You, know, you have an aging population, we live in welfare states, the state made a contract with its citizens that uh, the government will provide certain services, certain standards of living, um, uh, <laughs> even to those who can no longer um, uh, work and pay for themselves and sustain themselves. So there's uh, health insurance, uh, 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 jobless benefits, retirement benefits, all the key elements of uh, the social welfare state uh, are called into question by an aging population, a population of people who uh, <coughs> are no longer part of the workforce, no longer pay into uh, the welfare system, and uh, thus, thus pose a problem. And a concept like uh, so, uh, uh, successful aging can and must be understood against that background. You know, it's, it's sort of a normative conception of how, as an old person, you should be leading your life so as to um, uh, create as little um, cost uh, burden to the polity as, as, ever, as ever possible. So, and part of the criticism that uh, Ossia was referring to as a concept like that, of course, has to do with the fact that there's a strong normative um, uh, content to it and uh, that it implicitly devalues all forms of aging that cannot be uh, discussed under that rubric. Um, the other important uh, political context of uh, uh, this project and of Volkswagen's interest in this topic and in their readiness to fund a project like this is Europe. Uh, they're talking about the continent, and Europe, as you know, is sort of an oscillating, shifting term. Um, and uh, it's a geographical denomination, but it's also the name of a big political project known as the European Union. Now, what's interesting about those two films is that in a very specific film, in a sense, they're not European films. Namely, in the sense that they're from countries which are not part of the European Union. One by choice, and the other one partly by choice, partly as a form of punishment. Um, Switzerland, of course, is, for all practical purposes, a member of the European Union, but they still continue to pretend to be that they're not, or continue to pretend that they're not, so they're not formal members and not part of any of the uh, governing bodies. Um, but, you know, in the name of neutrality and independence, Switzerland still chooses not to be um, a member of the European Union. Um, but there, uh, the Swiss labor market and the Swiss regulation, the regulatory system is fully integrated with the, with the European Union. To the lasting disappointment of our right-wing nationalists who would prefer Switzerland to uh, go the way of Britain and opt out of that, those contractual frameworks, uh, even at the price of losing the obvious economic uh, benefits of being uh, part of de facto being part of the European regulatory space and uh, benefiting in particular from the four freedoms, including the freedom of movement and the, the economic freedoms that um, are a good part of the reason for the relative prosperity of the European Union and a good part of the reason why everyone in Central Europe who has a clear mind wants to be a member of the European Union. Now, um, Serbia, the case of Serbia is of course different. Uh, of the former Yugoslav countries, or the countries, the successor states of Yugoslavia, um, Croatia and Slovenia are full members of the European Union, and um, Croatia is now, Slovenia and Croatia now also uh, have the Euro, so they're part of the European economic system. Um, Serbia, like Turkey, is an internal candidate. Um, so they have candidate status, they're pro forma negotiating accession, um, but with the current government that's not going to be possible. Um, uh, and 
part of the reason is that uh, there's a lingering problem also with Serbia's role in the breakup of Yugoslavia, or the breakup of Yugoslavia, and with uh, um, some of the politi politics of the ruling elites in Serbia, um, uh, which uh, at this point make uh, the full integration of Serbia into the European Union a very unlikely person. Um, what's interesting, if you will, is that there's a mental geography of Europe and that part from which this film is, the so-called Balkans, uh, which is also flexible and fungible. Uh, many of you will know uh, the name of Slavoj Žižek. Probably heard of Slavoj Žižek, the philosopher who likes to write about film and talk about film. Probably the most famous intellectual of the last 30 years from the post he was off space. Uh, quite a controversial figure, but also very entertaining. And there's a there, there's two there's several versions of that video out, uh, but and you can look it up on YouTube. It's quite entertaining. Um, uh, where Slavoj Žižek talks about the question where Balkan starts. Uh, the first version he's fairly young. I think that's almost 30 years old. He's, sta he's standing on a bridge in uh, Ljubljana, his hometown, and says says you know both sides of the river look exactly the same, nice buildings, uh, nice trees, it looks almost like Paris, but this really is the place where Balkan starts. So on, on, the, on the south side of the river, we have these houses and we have dark rituals, and the, 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 the punchline of, of, of his story there is that he says, women getting raped, um, don't like it, uh, no, women getting raped, like it, and on the non-Balkan side, women getting raped, don't like it. So that's the difference he puts there. Typical Slavoj Žižek provocation. And then there's another version of that video, which is much longer, <laughs> where he stands, uh, um, where he talks in front of the map of former Yugoslavia, and basically says, you know, wherever you are in Europe, south of you is where Balkan starts, except for the Greek, because for them, Balkan is in the north. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a completely fungible category, and it's, it's a mental map that really changes. Um, and one of the interesting things that happened recently is when Croatia joined the Euro after having joined um, uh, the European Union uh, uh, quite a few years before, um, the Financial Times stopped referring to Croatia as a Balkan country and switched to calling Croatia a Adriatic country. So the integration in the Euro completely changed the mental map. Of, of those terms. What I'm trying to get at is that um, those are two non-European films in a very strict political bureaucratic sense, but at the same time they are uh, profoundly European. And um, proof of that, or maybe there is still an underlying uh, connection and yeah, lineage uh, that uh, still connects the two films. The first thing I was thinking after having watched um, have you seen this woman? Is that uh, the first reference that came to my mind? It was actually uh, a Swiss novel, um, very famous novel by Max Frisch, one of the two uh, pillars, towers of post -war, Swiss post-war and German film literature together with Friedrich Bühlmann. Um, Max Frisch wrote a, a, a novel in, in 1954, published a novel in 1954 called Stiegler, uh, which is basically about a guy who uh, returns to Zurich from abroad and is identified by everyone in the city as the sculptor Stiegler, and he refuses to accept that identification. And so the first line of the novel is, Ich bin nicht Stiegler. And the whole novel is a screed against all the people who pretend to know him and to pretend to be his friends and to have grown up with him and help him along on his way as an artist and say, well, yes, you are Stiller. And he says, well, no, I'm not. And you're mistaken. I'm not that guy. And uh, what this film does is tell the same story three times in a row with three different, different roles. In way. So in terms of form, have cycles and it's a genre film, and I think you brilliantly showed that it's basically a high film, and that the high film pro pro provides a framework of safety and security that allows them to tell the story in a way that's sort of 
acceptable and humorous and funny, but also, you know, provides the kind of basic nostalgic mood that makes it safe to to make the statements that the film is making. Um, by comparison, this is a radically modern film. It's a, it's a highly disruptive, uh, challenging uh, uh, film that shows us people and things and acts and locations that you, well, don't give you a fuzzy sense of happiness in the place that you want to go back to. Um, and then, of course, the choice of having this uh, three different stories told with the same actress, same settings, no clear markers. It takes you a certain moment to figure out the principle, the narrative principle of the film. But then, through the repetition and variation, uh, the film creates additional layers of meaning that uh, are, of course, extremely rich and, and make the film as a whole, even though it is relatively short, 70 minutes, um, uh, seem actually like richer and longer. I found the, the temporality and the effect of the film really, really interesting. It's a short film, but it's, it's, a, it's a big film, <laughs> in a way, because it's so rich and, and uh, challenging in, in the way uh, it is set up. One of the things that we already talked about, Ozzy and me, is um, uh, real estate and maintenance. I mean, the film starts obviously significantly because that's the choice of the director with a long pan over a construction sign, then zooms in on the building, on the house, uh, where somebody then doesn't reappear again, it seems to be some kind of journalist, tells us about the disappearance of the woman and the, the way the, the family searched for her for a full year and then gave up. And clearly, you know, took possession of her apartment or now restructuring it and trying to sell it. Um, but at the same time, in the rest of the film, um, you see the protagonist, who we then intuit is the character who's missing, uh, in surroundings that clearly have, let's put it that way, a maintenance problem. Um, the buildings are dilapidating, the spaces are dirty. Uh, in the first episode, she's, a, she's a, a vacuum cleaner saleswoman who goes to uh, lower middle class, working class people's apartments to offer demonstrations of, of the, uh, the vacuum cleaner. And they basically, you know, in one of the scenes, you have a couple sitting on the sofa saying, yeah, it's nice to have you. Why don't you clean our house here? Uh, there's, there's some more stuff that you could uh, clean up with your vacuum cleaner. Um, so there's a, there's a sense of squalor, um, uh, decay uh, that, that is quite a challenge. Uh, it's rare also in, I mean, in a genre film like that, and particularly in a, in a Swiss genre film like that, uh, you will probably not see such extended scenes depicting the, the life of homeless people living in uh, public spaces that were designed for consumption, like this uh, uh, sort of mall structure, um, uh, where we also have this disturbing sex uh, scene, uh, um, uh, which is a space that was designed for consumption, but clearly doesn't work as such. So it's also a, a history of economic uh, failure. Um, what's interesting about the character, of course, is that she does things that are totally not age appropriate. Like she goes to a techno club, takes drugs, and engages in uh, acts of intimacy with someone less than half her age. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, there is an interaction and there is a, there's a, a kind of in intimacy emerging um, which is very unsuspected and completely breaking with any kind of moment. And so, um, <laughs> building on what you were saying, Ozia, if the key concept uh, is the coming woman, what's interesting about the three episodes is the paradoxical structure of her refusing to be a certain type of woman, but becoming a very different woman at the same time. And uh, opening up for her forms of experience and uh, um, acquiring uh, experiences that would not normally be open to uh, uh, a woman of that age, who would just be assigned her role and be spending most of her time in an apartment. And the touching, the most touching shot probably is the one at the end where they 
do a pan of the um, of the apartment building, and you have all these uh, old ladies waving to the camera, and uh, in a way that's it's also an nod to these women. It's uh, a way of saying, you know, they could not have had the same story, the same experience, their various their experience, but at the same time, they also live lives where that's not a possibility. And and uh, so it's a tribute uh, to the possibilities that, of unlived lives uh, that the film is also is also offering. Um, and so, to me, since the starting point for the next part of our discussion is what felt strange about it and what was what was it that you could not process about this film um, is is precisely the the kind of uh, visual uh, performative transgression that the film engages in um, by showing us someone in someone who would not normally in as that character be awarded a starring role in a film in environments where you would not normally go as a self-regarding, educated, art house cinema goer. Um, and uh, so that, that kind of, in a way, uh, alterity of space and biographical trajectory is something that, that can be deeply unsettling. And of course, one of the things I was asking myself is, is there any um, comparable uh, form of storytelling in Swiss film uh, at least the last 50 years, and the simple answer is, except for Andrea Stoppa's film, no, and she's from Sarri. So um, uh, there's there's an interesting connection right there. Um, but now we want to move on to a brief discussion of what we found strange in each of his films uh, in more detail, and I pass the microphone over back to Ajna and I'll take my seat alongside her. So what I found very strange in, in the late bloomers uh, is how these four ages are regarded uh, as in, in, in terms of costs, so in economic terms, when they are present. Um, like, okay, these are women in their 80s, even though it, it is a high genre, so it's more soothing and settling and cozy ambient, and nevertheless, uh, the sons of, of these two protagonists discuss um, uh, kind of um, their options, uh, or their uh, lifestyle choices, or uh, choices to be fulfilled, and they negate them completely, but discuss basically the properties uh, as something to be taken away from them, and sold, so tra transferred into money, into capital. And for me, this was a quite shocking because um, I don't know from where I come from. Even if this is an issue, it wouldn't have been discussed so openly uh, in front of elderly people, which are so vulnerable. So for me, this was, I would say, a cultural shock. Yeah. Uh, would you like to yeah, comment? Yeah, very briefly. There are two big terms that I have stopped using, but now I'm going to use them again, neoliberal and biopolitics. Um, the original meaning of biopolitics in Foucault, of course, is the, the system of governments which uh, is about the management of life rather than death. Uh, having people, you know, populations grow, populations uh, thrive, in the interest of uh, growing the power of the state. That's the original. <laughs> by politics, and in a way, you could say that the whole discourse about successful aging and the age pyramid and all that, and the concern about uh, the, the sustainability of the, of the welfare state in the face of the uh, changing age pyramid, is a classical example of classical biopolitics. These are modern European nation states worried about the economic performance and economic value of the population. That's straight out of the late 18th century. Not a lot of innovation. And neoliberal because it's all about quantifying uh, life processes in, in terms of uh, money and in terms of, you know, letting people live their lives but make sure that they pay their own rent and, and pay their own salary. Um, one significant detail in the film, I think, 
is the fact that the sun is a Protestant pastor. So religion comes into play, and it's of course played for laughs, uh, as you have seen even in the muted version of this trailer. Uh, the first customer is a woman who would wear no, those kinds of clothes, comes into the store and says, oh, I see, you already have a customer, the, the pastor, you know, as if the pastor were there to buy a lingerie and uh, talk to his mother. And she, she knows who the, the mother is and who the son is. But that's a wonderful joke, and it played well in the Kyoto Hilo Kano. That was a big laugh. Ha, 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 the pastor. But he's there for a reason, because he's the incarnation of the Protestant ethic uh, which leads, as a consequence, can lead to the kind of logic that, that you were describing. And, and um, I mean, one of the things that we also briefly talked about, and I think could matter as a frame of reference here, is that um, very broadly speaking, in the European, Northwestern European capitalist countries, poverty is a self inflicted condition. And people are responsible if they're. Poor, um, and you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you know, you shouldn't be poor. Uh, and if you're poor, it's the sign of moral failure. And if you're rich, it's the sign of divine grace, at least in the Swiss form of Protestantism, of which that particular pastor is an official, fu official functionary, because it's the, the Dorfkopf, he's part of the Protestant the state church in Switzerland, and that is a church deeply rooted in Calvinist doctrine. And Calvin's doctrine is all about uh, worldly success as an indicator, a necessary but not sufficient indicator of the high grace. Whereas in other religious traditions, uh, poverty has dignity. There's dignity to poverty, um, very broadly speaking, again, in the Orthodox realm. And that might be a difference here because um, one of the great things for me about uh, have you seen this film? Is that the film filmmakers love their character? They do not make fun of her. It's not a film made at the expense of the character. Uh, they also love the actress uh, and give her a big stage to do quite daring things. Um, and and that means you have basically basically an attitude towards that kind of liminal existence, which is tragic or positive. And that's, uh, to, me, to me, I would say, would be a very big stark contrast to what we're due in the Hell's I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, totally, it makes sense. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a very rational answer to, to my concern. Um, but uh, as you say, that, that uh, uh, directors, uh, love the character and the actress. The sense I got. No, no, it's definitely something I agree. I would say they love the actress mm. because they uh, they give her quite a lot of space to embody these different versions of Dragon and she's exquisite in, in doing this job. Um, but there is a kind of a humor which becomes also dark, but I think it's part of the uh, film not knowing what its register is about. As, as this identity is changing, uh, the film is changing its form as well. So at some point, I would say we as the viewer are as surprised by the line of action as the, the character herself. And sometimes I have the feeling that the film is indecisive whether it's a, it's a mystery, whether it's a fantasy or a comedy, sometimes there is this kind of aspect of carnivalesque, of a, a kind of a, a sensuality, but uh, exaggerated uh, to a point where it becomes a bit uh, kind of ridiculous. And I, I was a bit worried, okay, are we going to now see um, in other Kuzgurica film, and then I was relieved, okay, no, it's not actually going into this direction, it's just testing out different rounds. And this is the, the biggest quality about this film that I find, that sometimes the film itself doesn't know its own direction. I don't know if you, if you agree yeah. with this notion, but, yeah. Yeah, because maybe, 
And since you threw out the Custo Victor reference, you should explain that. Because Custo Victor has been away from the scene of cinema, the respectable scene of cinema for so long that people don't remember him if they're a certain age. These people seem to be too young to understand the Custo Victor reference. Yeah, so, and the Kustelica, is one of the most uh, famous director from the former uh, Yugoslavia and he made uh, films like When Father Was Away in Business, uh, Underground, and Underground was quite a success. It uh, was made in the mid-90s. Um, it's very controversial, uh, politically speaking, film. But it's very uh, carnivalesque and rich, visually uh, speaking. A film which kind of um, is more, or acts more like a postmodern pastiche. Uh, it, it, it kind of plays a lot with the notion of uh, exaggeration of bodily sensations. Uh, but also to a degree uh, where it embraces uh, uh, this kind of you know, um, all the acts uh, which kind of expose body in its most extreme ways, uh, but in a very uh, uh, interesting political context of, of basically socialist Yugoslavia and what kind of a farce uh, the, the politi political elites were part of, uh, basically, uh, by exposing uh, underground uh, as, 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 as the world, I mean, sorry, uh, now I don't have so much time to explain everything, uh, but uh, underground as a place where people, a uh, uh, place which people inhabited, who were uh, felt that they were kind of abused by the communist system, and they manufactured uh, something which will turn out to be weapons for the wars uh, that will be the Yugoslav disintegration wars. So, very uh, complex topic, uh, politically intriguing, but also problematic, at least from my point of view. And this kind of embrace of, of this uh, carnivalesque uh, 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 aspect goes sometimes into very uh, distasteful um, or, or takes a very distasteful turn. And uh, this film also is a bit in this tradition, but also by having a nod to Dusan Makarev, another brilliant uh, filmmaker uh, from Serbia, uh, uh, but it never actually makes totally fun of, of, of its character. And as you said, really endorses uh, Ksenia Marinkovic in her acting style. I don't know if this no. is too complicated, but this is uh, something that I just wanted to say. What I find fascinating. No, I, I, I think that that's a really important nuance. Uh, I would say this film is not an example of the of the Karen class, because the current class is about protest exaggeration, the inversion of all social hierarchies for a certain time period, of course, but, but it's it's ugly, it's, uh, you know, carnival, carnival rituals, um, exaggerated eating, uh, exaggeration of all bodily functions, and that would be the case of ugly. And that film never quite goes there. It's, it's not a grotesque character. Okay? I mean, there's, there's an absurd element to it, there's, and it, it rears towards the protest, it, it always refrains from completely abandoning the character to the protest. And what's also interesting, that, and I would ask you also to, to give your reading of that final shot. Um, in the final shot, I mean, there's, there's an earlier shot where she becomes halfway invisible, where she becomes her own shadow in a, in a superimposition. And the final shot, of course, is her rising to the skies as a Madonna-like vision of appearance, and as, as the mother saint of all the women in, in the apartment building. And uh, that, that also seemed to be a very interesting way of working with religious imagery, uh, which has something of the kitchen, the grotesque, that is not entirely so. It's, so it always veers into the brain of, of something distasteful, but it's never quite distasteful. I totally agree. It's never a kitsch because uh, I think it's uh, also, even if it appears challenging to sympathize with the character, one is and, and stays by the character all the time. 
And um, uh, this last bit, uh, which could be a kitschy ending, I would just like to uh, kind of elaborate more on this third part, which is for me the most challenging and interesting part of the film, because uh, she doesn't appear even to be a woman, totally, but an entity, because it begins with her being naked, roaming around uh, the garbage site, and entering an apartment, and you see, okay, she could be a daughter of an older couple, but then she kind of leaves soon and joins some other women at the garbage site. Okay, it could be some uh, women empowerment uh, session. No, she's not happy with that. She moves further uh, and joins um, um, a young, handsome man eating hamburger. So it could be a love interest. Is she somebody's lover? No, uh, she um, uh, runs away from this possibility, uh, then enters the car, she found the key. Okay, you, you believe, okay, she has to just run away uh, and finds a cake at the, at the car seat next to her. And in the, uh, in the cake, there is a voucher of a travel agency. Okay, so you hope she will finally get to go to travel to some exotic land, but then there is a, a car crash and there is a transgender person. So she's attentive to, to the transgender person that um, you know, she takes care of. Uh, okay, you think there is a possibility for some kind of a relationship and friendship? No, she runs away, she wants to go to the travel agency. Okay, with the travel agency, it doesn't turn out that well because uh, at the beginning uh, we didn't know who she is. She's a, a woman without memory, so a media, she could be anyone. But there, the travel agency, women who work there, they remember that actually she's a former actress uh, who used to um, um, make a commercial for their travel agency uh, and also borrowed a voice to Peppa Pig. And she's completely uh, now bothered by, by the ladies working there. And she even punches one and runs away, uh, is lost somewhere uh, in the woods, uh, and then wakes up and joins this uh, happy gathering of people. So I want to say that in all this voyage from one station to another, uh, there are possibilities of identity or construction of, uh, of subject, if you, if you will, that she could potentially occupy. But as it's offered uh, by society to her, imposed onto her, she rejects it each time. And, and, and this kind of a, a, a motherly uh, uh, image you were referring to, which could be kitschy, as the whole voyage could be kitschy and uh, also kind of a last in itself, it never is. Because it also does not last uh, that long to become that. And that's why I think the whole third segment of the film is, is a beautiful uh, illustration or performance of the concept of becoming a woman. Yeah, one last observation before we open up. Um, there, I mean, I, I said that one way of looking at the ending is to look at it in terms of religious symbolism. And one possibility of reading the trajectory in the last third is to see it as sort of the female version of the passion of the class. You know, it starts off with the Holy Family, and she's ejected from the family, or runs away from the family. And then she, there are the station, stations of suffering, stations of you know, the base and self basement. Uh, but she always um, refuses to become part of a specific situation that goes on and on. Yeah, she's sort of transfigured into this uh, celestial figure. Um, uh, and so that's also, of course, a gender role uh, reversal, uh, if indeed you accept that there is somehow an underlying Christology, um, but, but uh, completely inverted. Okay, thank you so much for having shared this journey with us. Uh, it's been a really uh, interesting series of events. Um, thank you, Olga, for coming back after you had uh, so wonderfully opened uh, the proceedings at the beginning of the term. Um, our work continues, and we will keep you updated through Olga and other platforms and venues about the progress of our 
project. There, there, there will be a conference here in Frankfurt at some point in the near future, two or three years from now. Um, we have our website where you can follow the, the, pro, the progress of the project. Um, all the talks, save one, but we're correcting that, have been recorded and are available through the website. You find a lot of additional material on the website, so uh, we would be thrilled if you could stay engaged the way you were by participating in all of our lectures and events. Uh, the very last word was the Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for showing up.